Welcome to a very special Friday night episode of the greatest talk show in the universe. The structure of tonight's episode goes as follows. It's divided into four parts. There will be three reading sections and one section for the main theme of the episode. Reading section will include reading from final part of the rhyme of the ancient mariner as well as the continued reading of T.G. Wodehouse's Aunt's Omnibus. Let's start this highly educative session with part one. We shall begin with Homer's Iliad book one, The Rage of Achilles. Rage goddess sing the rage of Peleus's son Achilles. Murderous doom that caused the Achaeans countless losses. Hurling down to the house of death so many sturdy souls. Great fighters souls but made their bodies carrion. Feast for the dogs and birds. And the will of Zeus was moving towards its end. Begin news when the two first broke and clash. Memnon, lord of men and brilliant Achilles. What god drove them to fight with such a fury? Apollo, the son of Zeus and Leto. Incensed at the king, he swept a fatal plague through the army. Men were dying and all because Agamemnon spurred Apollo's priest. Yes, Kyrus's approached the Achaeans' fast ships to win his daughter back, bringing a priceless ransom and bearing high in hand, wound on a golden staff, the reach of God, the distance deadly archer. He begged the whole Achaean army, but most of all the two supreme commanders, Atreus's two sons, Agamemnon, Menelaus, all Argives get for war. May the gods who hold the halls of Olympus give you Priam's city to plunder, then save passage home. Just set my daughter free, my dear one. Here, accept these gifts, this ransom. Honor the God who strikes from worlds away, the son of Zeus, Apollo. And all ranks of Achaeans cried out their assent. Respect the priest, accept the shining ransom. But it brought no joy to the heart of Agamemnon. The king dismissed the priest with a brutal order. Ringing in his ears, never again, old man, let me catch sight of you by the hollow ships. Not loitering now, not slinking back tomorrow. The staff and the reach of God will never save you then. The girl, I won't give up the girl. Long before that, old age will overtake her in my house in Argos. Far from her fatherland, slaving back and forth at the loom, forced to share my bed. Now go, don't tempt my wrath, and you may depart alive. The old man was terrified. He obeyed the order, turning, trailing away in silence down the shore, where the battle lines of breakers crash and drag and moving off to a safe distance over and over, the old priest prayed to the son of sleek-haired Leto, Lord Apollo, Hear me, Apollo, god of the silver bow, who strikes the wall of Chris and Scylla sacrosanct, lord in power of Tenedos, Smintheus, god of the plague, if I ever roofed a shrine to please your heart, ever burned the long rich bones of bulls and goats, 
on your holy altar. Now, now bring my prayer to pass. Pay the tenants back your arrows for my tears. His prayer went up and Phoebus Apollo heard him. Down he strode from Olympus peaks, storming at heart with his bow and hooded quiver slung across his shoulders. The arrows clanged at his back as the god quaked with rage. The god himself on the march and down he came like night. Over against the ships he dropped to a knee, let fly a shaft and a terrifying clash rang out from the great silver bow. First he went for the mules and circling dogs, but then, launching a piercing shaft at the men themselves, he cut them down in droves, and the corpse fires burned on night and day. Nine days the arrows of God swept through the army. On the tenth, Achilles called all ranks to muster. The impulse seized him, sent by white-armed Hera, grieving to see Achaean fighters drop and die. Once they had gathered, crowding the meeting grounds, the swift runner Achilles rose and spoke among them. Son of Atreus, now we are beaten back, I fear. The long campaign is lost, so whom we sail. If we can escape our death, if war and plague are joining forces now to crush the Argives. But wait, let us question a holy man. A prophet, even a man skilled with dreams. Dreams as well can come our way from Zeus. Come, someone to tell us why Apollo wages so whether he blames us for a vow we failed or sacrifice, if only the god would share the smoky savour of lambs and full-grown goats, Apollo might be willing still somehow to save us from this plague. I was reading this very interesting article about how technology acts as a distraction, acts as impediment to actual face-to-face -face physical human communication. But in the contemporary times, in the times of this circus that is being created, that now technology has a different definition. But is technology really a distraction? First, we need to understand that right now, what one has is a myopic understanding of technology. For us, technology is limited to artificial intelligence, internet of things, all our digital devices. That is basically what has been happening in the second half of the 21st century. Anything that is artificial, anything that can work at super speeds, super computers, quantum speed, computers, computers that can solve mathematical calculation in milliseconds. That is something which awes us. That is something which we preview as technology. Analyze the following lines. Distraction has become the norm. We are blessed with pocket-sized supercomputers that connect us to anyone and everyone and a buffet of information. But there's a dark side. Those same gadgets distract us, often at the moments that matter most. In this context, the definition of distraction is subjective, which means that even though we are proud of these dumb supercomputers or the dumb smartphones that connect us with everything and everyone, distraction is subjective. We allow ourselves to be distracted by these gadgets. It's not the gadgets that distract us. It's we who purview these gadgets as our own little world. We get so involved in it that we forget that something else beyond this lies 
outside even before these dumb smartphones came into existence before these super gadgets came into existence before the idea of artificial intelligence came into existence well artificial intelligence always has been omnipresent because artificial intelligence is misnomer because anything that is artificial cannot be intelligent imagine if a robotic like individual whom we call autobots or humanoid takes over this talk show which means that instead of a human being producing this talk show it's a humanoid it's an artificial being means that it will follow a certain pattern and then unlike humans it will not deter from that pattern which means that it will not improvise which is a human specialty that is the biggest difference between something that is artificial which cannot be intelligent versus the actual human cognition and intelligence but in the context of what is a distraction for time in memorial human beings have always considered something a distraction whether it was the television from the crt to the current lcd and then came the flood of gadgets idea of distraction what is a distraction has always been a source of debate which means that you will read in a few pseudo self help books that one should distract themselves which means that one should take a break from work and what is the self to taking a break well distract yourself how do you distract yourself go outside go to a restaurant well in the times where we could walk into a restaurant we would do that now it's almost as if walking into a restaurant is akin to walking into fort knox the idea of distraction has always been subjective but but limiting it to gadgets is something i do not actually agree with i also have a plethora of gadgets with me i have the computers the dumb smartphones I have both analog and digital distractions but just because i have a phone with me it doesn't mean that i will be peering into it all the time i will take a break and that break doesn't mean that i do not think that this particular gadget is useful or useless there are times when i find myself staring at the computer i think what do i do what am i doing here we get distracted because we get bored but why do we get bored of the work when that is something that is unique to every individual what defines the term bored is something that even i cannot decipher at this point time in memorial we have always been told that do not stress yourself do not put one cell to death and what does that mean we are told that if you are working on something whether it's using a pen and a paper that is the analog devices or whether it's a computer or the dumb smartphone that is the digital devices it's important to take a break staring at something for long is always considered bad for the eyes neck and the rest of your body so sitting on the chair for hours is actually not considered the best way to take care of your body so what do we do we distract ourselves how do we distract ourselves well once upon a time we could call our friends a random conversation or we would watch a television program so yes human beings have always wanted to distract themselves from the work they are working so whether they use technology as something that is useful or whether they use technology as something that is distraction is subjective let's look at these lines and analyze them of course the dumb smartphones then invent distraction they are just the latest culprit before that we blamed television and before that it was the telephone or comic books or the radio go back more than 2000 years and socrates was even criticizing the written word 
for causing forgetfulness in the learner's soul. It's a universal truth that the pseudo media has caused such a earthquake in the way we write. Writing 200 characters means that our vocabulary goes. What vocabulary can you expect in these pseudo media sites? When you are forced to write in 200 words, when everything is becoming micro, there is no vocabulary, there is no grammar, there is a bad masala of two languages. An example which most of my listeners will understand. This is the scenario. You have an exam tomorrow. You are reading and your parents or someone who is living with you, whether it's your parents or anyone, you are in the hostel, the hostel warden walks in and then you are reading a book. And that's the way the parents will see. What they see is that you are revising for the exams. But what you are really doing, if we take the camera angle to the other side, is that you are putting a comic book or any other such book Inside the book we are actually reading. So yes, human beings have always been distracted. 30 years ago that comet the same, the same eyeballs as the pseudo media sites do today. As I said, distraction is not forced upon us. Nobody says that you have to be on the pseudo media sites 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, tweeting something nonsense all the time or replying to somebody else's nonsense all the time. Distraction is an excuse. Distraction is a choice which we want to have. If I don't want to distract myself from my work, I will not allow myself to be distracted. Before that, we need to look at technology beyond what we see today. Technology is just not limited to artificial intelligence, is not limited to Internet of Things is not limited to quantum speed computers or super computers. It's not limited to dumb smartphones. Once upon a time, we used to look at an individual and a country's progress by saying that they have the housing, the clothing and a job. But right now, that's not enough. Add one more important point having a gadget, having the internet access and if the citizens of a country don't have access, if only 20-25% of the citizens of a country have access to gadgets, then it's seen as something that the country is not progressing and we see it as something as if it's the end of the world. It's a unique situation and that is nothing more than a choice. If an individual, despite having access to technology, decides to go analog, respect that person for it. If an individual decides not to waste time, not to waste hours spent on technology, then respect that person for it. But don't, for your own fatal flaw, blame that lifeless artificial is to be able to complete our work. Distraction is a choice. Distraction is which we do it consciously. It's not a subconscious thing. We know we are distracting ourselves because we want that. Actually, the question is, is technology a distraction? Well, first understand what is technology. Go beyond the limited definition of technology and then you will understand whether it's a distraction or whether it's something else. This section is reading section part 2 that is Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. This hermit goat lives in that wood which slopes down to the sea. Loudly his sweet voice he raises. He loves to talk with marinades that come from a far country. He kneels at morn and noon and eve. He hath a cushion plump. It is the moss that wholly hides that rotted old oak stump. The skiff boat neared. I heard them talk. Why this is strange, I trow. 
Where are those lights so many and fair that signal made but now? Strange by faith the hermit said, and they answered not a cheer. The planks look warped and see those sails, how thin they are and sear, and never saw aught like to them, unless perchance it were. Brown skeletons of leaves that lag my forest brook along, when the ivy tore is heavy with snow, and the owlet whoops to the wolf below that eats the she wolf's young. Dear Lord, it had a fiendish look, the pilot made reply. I am a feared push on, push on, said the hermit cheerily. The boat came closer to the ship, but I nor spake nor stirred. It came close beneath the ship, and straight a sound was heard. Under the water it rumbled on, still louder and more dread. It reached the ship, it split the bay, the ship went down like lead. Stunned by that loud and dreadful sound which sky and ocean smote like one that hath been seven days drowned, my body lay afloat. But swift as dreams myself I found within the pilot's boat. Upon the swirl where sank the ship, boat spun, wound and bound. And all was still, save that the hill was telling of the sound. I moved my lips, let shriek, and fell down in a fit. The holy hermit raised his eyes and prayed where he did sit. I took the oars, the pilot's boy, who now doth crazy go. Laughed loud and long, and all the while his eyes went to and fro. Ha ha, quoth it he, full plain I see, devil knows how to row. Now, all in my own country, I stood on the firm land. The hermit stepped forth from the boat, and scarcely he could stand. Oh, shrive me, shrive me, holy man. The hermit crossed his brow. Say quick, quoth he, I bid thee say. What manner of man art thou? But this frame of mine was wenched with woeful agony, which forced me to begin my tale, and then it left me free. Since then at an uncertain hour that agony returns, until my ghastly tale is told, the heart within me burns. I pass like night, from land to land, I have strange power of speech. That moment that is faced, I see, I know the man that must hear me. To him my tale I teach. What loud uproar bursts from that door? The wedding guests are there. But in the garden bower, the bride and the bridemaids singing are, and half the little whisper bell, which bidded me to prayer. O wedding guest, this soul hath been alone on a white, white sea. So lonely it was that God himself scarce seemed there to be. O sweeter than the marriage peace, sweeter far to me to walk together to the cur with a goodly company. To walk together to the cur and all together pray, while each to his great father bends, old men and babes and loving friends and youths and maidens gay. Farewell, farewell, but this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest, he prayeth well who loveth well, both man and bird and beast. He prayeth best who loveth best, all things both great and small, for the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all. The mariner whose eye is bright, whose beard with age is hoar, is gone and now the wedding guest 
turned from the bridegroom's door, he went like one that had been stunned and is of sense forlorn. A sadder and a wiser man, he rose the morrow morn. This is the final part of tonight's episode that is reading session part 3. We continue with reading P.G. Woodhouse's Aunt's Omnibus. Let's begin. Only the circumstance of my being in bed at the moment kept me from dancing a few carefree steps. You speak absolute sooth, Jeeves. This lets me out. Completely, sir. Perhaps you wouldn't mind going and explaining the position of affairs to Stiffy now. You can tell the story so much better than I could and she ought to be given the low down as soon as possible. I don't know where she is at this time of day but you'll find her messing about somewhere I have no doubt. I saw Miss Bing in the garden with Mr. Pinker, sir. I think she was trying to prepare him for his approaching ordeal. Huh? If you recall, sir, owing to the temporary indisposition of the vicar, Mr. Pinker will be in sole charge of the school treat tomorrow. And he views the prospect with not unnatural qualms. There is a somewhat lawless element among the school children of Tortelay in the world and he fears the worst. Well, tell Stiffy to take a couple of minutes off from the pep talk and listen to your communique. Very good, sir. He was absent quite a time. So long, in fact, that I was dressed when he returned. I saw Miss Bing, sir, and she is still insistent that you restore the statuette to Mr. Plank. She's cuckoo. I can't get into the collection room. No, sir, but Miss Bing can. She informs me that not long ago, Sir Watkin Chan to drop his key and she picked it up and omitted to apprise him. Sir Watkin had another key made, but the original remains in Miss Bing's possession. Clutch the brow. I mean, she can get into the room anytime she feels like it. Precisely, sir. Indeed, she has just done so. And so saying, he finished the eyesore from an inner pocket and handed it to me. Miss Bing suggests that you take the object to Mr. Plank after luncheon. In her droll way, she said the meal, I quote her words, would put the necessary stuffing into you and nerve you for the... It's somewhat early, sir. But shall I get you a little brandy? Not a little, Jeeves, I said. Fetch the cask. I don't know how Emerald Stoker was with brush and palette, never having seen any of her output. But she unquestionably had what it takes where cooking was concerned and any householder would have been glad to sign her up for the duration. Lunch she provided was excellent, everything most toothsome. But with this ghastly commission of stiffies on the agenda paper, I had little appetite for her offerings. The brow was furrowed, the manner displayed, the stomach full of butterflies. Hope you enjoyed this very educative session tonight and this is why no automation, no humanoid, no artificial intelligence can ever produce a talk show because it's not just about what you say and how you do the technical stuff. It's about how you present it and that is something which no artificial intelligence can ever learn. Rambo. Joshua.
for more awesome content tune in to the next episode of the weekly show with aditya